Katrina Hussein, a lawyer and founder of the Academic Collaboration Consulting, Michael Hyatt, an entrepreneur and investor, and Merrill Africa is chair of the advisory board of Canadian Association of Urban Financial Professionals. Welcome to you all. Uh, let's start with the changes to COVID-19 benefits this weekend. The Canadian uh, Canada Recovery Benefit is one of the programs ending today. It'll be replaced by the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit. Others uh, rolling out uh, into next year. Um, tremendous number of programs to keep our eye on, but Sharina, let's talk about the very fact that the shift has started. Is this the right time to do it? Well, at this point, we've always known that these benefits have been temporary. And one of the biggest uh, concerns that have existed for some time is whether or not they're targeted. And if we take a step back, we have to recognize that all these benefit programs exist because first and foremost, there's a public health crisis. And until that's under control, then these safety measures that are put in place by the government can then be re-examined for purposes of either being tinkered with or to be removed entirely. So what we're hearing from the federal government is that we're looking to perhaps May 2022 as being that deadline for a variety of this, these programs to then be phased out which is premised, of course, on whether or not we will then have the, um, the, the public health crisis under control. And for the most part, we've seen vaccination rates go up. We've seen a variety of different um, industries reopen in stages. So for that reason, it's beginning to offer some confidence that you can begin to lessen these programs. But that being said, it's all of the details of what's replacing it. And some Canadian businesses may find it difficult to adjust as some of those subsidy programs are phased out. Not just the details, but the vagary of the pandemic that we are still, of course, very much, uh, very much uh, dealing with still. So, uh, Michael, there's been a lot of talk around the fact that we're back to pre-pandemic employment levels, and yet everywhere we go, there are help-wanted signs. Uh, some have argued that that is because of those benefits, that people are waiting it out. Others have said that's just not fair, and the numbers don't bear it out. What do you think about the COVID-19 benefits starting to taper down and what effect it might have on labour shortages? Yeah, so it's really interesting. We're hit by a freight train literally last, uh, well, 2020 March, and then the government responded, I think, appropriately with a tremendous amount of stimulus, didn't ask a lot of questions, and just pump money into the system, which they needed to do. That stimulus has had a whole bunch of effects, including inflation. But what's interesting, now that we've watched what's happened in America, they cut those programs back ahead of us, and the labor shortage didn't change. And why is that? That's because mainly the jobs are in the wrong place. Many, many smaller towns and places in rural areas don't have the people in construction or places where they need them. So it's not really that people are just staying staying home because they got these. They're just labors in the wrong place because the whole industry is being readjusted. There's also a second effect, which is very, very interesting for a number of jobs. You know, they call it work-life balance, but I think people discovered after kind of having working from home and doing everything else, they rediscovered a little bit, and this is a little bit of the effect of the life work balance. And I wonder if there is a great resignation going on. So you've got a little bit of it in the wrong place and also people readjusting to really what they want to do. Yeah, anecdotally, I'm finding it fascinating. People who are saying, oh, I'm not going to rush back to the office and I'll keep right. working from home and maybe, and uh, their people have retired. And That's right. But listen, I, I, if a company's going to force their employees back five days a week, I think they're going to lose them. I think the max you're going to get an employee back in, uh, in the underground here in the path is two or three days a week. Okay, that's the uh, famous uh, pedestrian mall uh, underneath uh, Toronto's uh, Bay Street, where I spent years right. of my life delivering messages to Bay Street. Uh, but Merrill, uh, on this one, uh, what will you be watching for in the months ahead? Yeah, I think what I'll be looking for is the ways in which, you know, the feds are really going to adapt policy going forward. I think the biggest um, concern that we've heard coming out of this is that clearly the EI benefits policies not adequate for workers. Um, I'll also be looking to see, you know, what are employers also going to be doing in terms of actually responding um, to the outcry for better wage increases. We've seen that Amazon has increased their wages. Um, Walmart did, I think, a year ago. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. It's not just the folks that are working on Bay Street, but it's these frontline workers, right? We saw that Loblaws had, in had increased um, the the comp for their tellers, their frontline workers, to $13 an hour, then rolled that back. And I think these are issues that workers are having. Um, and these are the real reasons why they're not coming back despite um, the benefits. I think there's going to be a real conversation um, for corporations around what is the compensation that we actually want to give our workers to get them in the door, um, and what are the shifts that we're going to give these low-income workers as well. So that dovetails.